Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to take you back from when I was a kid and the prophecy that was prayed over me when I was 13, and it happened three more times after that. Um, I was prayed over that God would use me in a mighty way, and he would use me to save many for his kingdom. So... On December 23rd of 2002, um, we were doing some last minute Christmas shopping, my sister and I, and we went to Cary to pick up my fiance, Christopher Sawyer. And we picked him up, I threw the keys at him, I remember that. Um, he was driving, I was the passenger. And my sister, Rebecca, was behind me. And I was turned with my back facing my window, laughing, talking to both Chris and Becca, having a good time. And we were on State Route 568 coming to Finley. And it was about well, 3, 3.30 in the afternoon and a beautiful sunny Monday morning and something caught Christopher's eye. And my sister said that, that a dog was chasing after our car. And Chris swerved because the dog dashed out and he didn't know what it was. So he swerved to miss it. And you guys can bring up the next one, next one. He swore next one. There. He swore to me to say, and as you can see, we came in. Do you see the tire tracks? Oh, yeah, um, we came in going at 65 miles an hour, and we hit the tree. The, tr the car came up and landed at a 180. I was, go back to the, that one. I was in the passenger seat seat excuse me I was in the passenger seat and I when we actually hit the tree you would think I would be ejected I wasn't wearing a seat belt um so I wasn't wearing a seat belt but I ended up with my feet dangling flipped backwards in my sister's lap okay and Christopher was driving and from what paramedics told my sister who later then told me he dove in front of me to protect me and um becca you can go to the picture of the back seat with her knees prints yeah my sister was behind me her those are her knee prints in the seat she knocked my headrest off with her face and um is lucky to be alive lucky that she didn't break her neck um very very blessed um so my injuries were very very serious i had very, very serious brain trauma. My parents tell me that I should have died, that the doctor came to them after reading my brain scan and told them that I shouldn't have made it through, that the lesions on my brain should have killed me immediately, but they didn't. Thanks, thanks to God Almighty for that. Um, I uh, blew out my ankle um, it was out of my skin. Um, I crushed my humerus. I, um, had all of my ribs broken but one. I had a broken jaw. I had, um, let's see, brain, jaw, um, wrist, humerus. My, um, neck. I had a Christopher Reeves injury done to my neck. Um, the only difference is why I'm walking and he's not 
is his spinal cord was snapped, mine was intact. But the same was my muscles and my ligaments were shredded away from my neck. So my spinal cord was flying around freely inside my vertebrae. So neck, humerus, wrist, blown out ankle, my pelvis was broken in three places. Um, they had to end up life lighting um, Chris and I because I took a turn for the worst at the accident site um, in the same helicopter flight. And um, as, you, as you can show the picture of the roof, as you can see, they, they had to take off the roof because I was pinned between the ceiling and my, and my seat. And Chris was laying down because he, he dove in front of me. My sister said that uh, an angel got her out of the car before she saw Chris because he was in pretty bad shape. Um, so they had to end up taking off the car, got us out, ended up like fighting us to MCO where they told my parents that I should not be alive. Um, when, after they read my brain scan, they told my mom that she shouldn't be here, that she has lesions on her brain that should have killed her and she would only come back to you maybe 20%. That I would be a vegetable for the rest of my life. I would have to have food fed to me and that I wouldn't be able to live on my own, have babies like I wanted to, uh, live my life, go old with my husband. And um, my mom, out of the kind, my mom told the doctor that he did not know who her God was and that he did not know who I was. She will recover. The next week, the doctor, the doctor um, came back after reading a brain scan and told my mom that he made a mistake what was the percentage that he made a mistake? What, how much did he say? He switched it from 20% to 80%. He told her that I would come back 80%. And again, my mom said, you don't know my God and you don't know my daughter. She's gonna come back to me 100%. And you have to, I'm gonna backtrack a little bit because I told you guys to remember something, to remember the prophecy that was prayed over me. When this accident happened and I was not expected to live, um, my dad looked at my mom, grabbed her hands and said, honey, we have to hold on to faith. We have to hold on that God's not through with her, that she has a lot in store, what was prayed over her. We have to hold on to that. No matter what is told to us, we have to hold on to that. So she's like, okay, we will. And day after day after day, the doctors were giving my parents negative reports Day after day after day, my mom and my dad would go to God in prayer, praying that they would be wrong. And before every surgery that I had to go through, my dad told the doctors and the interns, say a prayer over your hands, cutting into my daughter. You say a prayer for her. So my parents were in prayer the whole State of Ohio, I think, was in prayer for me. Um, I was in a coma for about two and a half, three months, right? Six months. I was in the uh, hospital for six months. Sorry. Yeah, yeah hospital for six months. In a coma for three months. 
yeah, for about three. The first, one of the very first memories that I have. Now, let me backtrack again, I'm sorry. I'm not following my list, I apologize. When I died, I went to a place of peace. Well, let me backtrack more. On the helicopter flight, they took two trauma one patients to MCO. They don't usually do that. But like I said, I took a turn for the worse and they lost me on the accident site. And I remember going to a place of peace. I didn't, I didn't see anything. I was just so peaceful. And then once I was on the helicopter flight, I died again. They lost me again. And this time I was watching them get everything together to try to bring me back. I was watching them, you know, rip open my shirt. I was watching them say, grab the cart. That was very scary. Um, and then a light grabbed my attention. And when I turned to face this light, it was peaceful. It was a new place. And as I got closer, my heart was bursting with this peace. I, I can't explain it. The love and the peace and the joy that you have when you enter into that place. I, I can't explain it. It's just peaceful. And that peace that I felt stayed with me throughout my entire coma. So when mom and dad say that I was in a coma, I really wasn't inside my head. I was with family. I was with those who came to see me. It was like life was going on in the coma. So mom and dad say that my left leg was wicked in the coma. I was very active inside this coma. And you can turn to me in the bed. I was very active. So like you see my leg up, that, that would have been like my leg was everywhere. Like I was laughing in my coma, even though they couldn't see that. And even though my parents didn't know if I was gonna make it, I knew it was gonna be okay. God told me when I was in that place of peace, he told me that he wasn't through with me yet, that it wasn't my time, that I had a lot in store for his kingdom, that I had to return to my body to fulfill what I was supposed to fulfill. So I knew it was going to be okay. Okay. I knew I was going to be fine, but my parents being told all this negative stuff didn't know if it was going to be okay. It would be one step forward, 10 steps back, one step forward, 10 more steps back, not knowing you know, what was gonna happen, but I knew my heart was at peace. So one of my very first memories of coming, of becoming awake, because you have stages of coma. And I was at one of the earliest stages, so everybody had to keep hush hush that my fiance was killed. So, Everybody kept quiet about that because I kind of remember when I would come to being in so much pain, but then when I would go back into a coma, I wouldn't be, it would be peaceful. So it was kind of like, I was thinking that 
that dream world of living life with my family, not being in pain was the actual life for me. And then being in all that pain and not wanting to move, not wanting to wake up was my dreams. So there was a time where my parents had to say, keep quiet, don't say anything. Don't say that she was in a car accident. Don't tell her she lost Chris. Just let it be. And so, I would, like I said, I started waking up. And one of the very first memories, like distinct memories that I have is I was laying in bed. I had a trach. And so... I kept, they had a cool mist collar on the trach and I kept pulling at it and the, and the coma, like I knew it wasn't supposed to be there. So I kept pulling at it. Well, I pulled the trach actually out of my airway. And my mom said to a nurse at Fairhaven, I think her trach's out, it looks weird. And she kept telling nurses this well, one finally came and looked at it and ran out of the room saying, the trick is out, the trick is out. And how long was that? A week? It was less than 24 hours. I mean, I asked four or five nurses to come and they said it was okay. And then the nurse said, she just went running out, called 911, called 911, trick's out. Yeah. So, so I was persistent. <laughs> yeah. I knew something was different. So they ended up brushing me to the nearest hospital in Upper Sandusky, why not Memorial? And um, I'm not sure how Linda, Chris's mom, came to the hospital there. She just showed up. She showed up at the hospital and she came in. And my, my mind was back enough to know I knew her. Like they kept asking me if I knew if I knew people, and I would get the yes signal because I couldn't talk because of the trach. And um, she came in, and I'm like, okay, I know you, but how do I know you? I know you, so I followed her around with my eyes, not knowing that they took my trach out, okay? Because I still had that burning feeling that the trach was still there. And so she came in, she started walking around and I looked at her and I'm like, I know you, how do I know you? I know you. And it all came back. Oh, that's Chris's mom, your boyfriend, your fiance. And of course I got excited. I'm like, okay, okay. He's gonna be the next one in. Well, he wasn't the next one in. One of his friends came in. So I looked at his friend and I'm like, okay, how do I know you? You're not Chris, how do I know you? So I followed him around and I was like, okay, yeah, you're one of Chris's friends. He's gonna be the next one in. Cause I was thinking maybe, maybe he wants to see their reaction before he came in. So he came in, he went off the corner and said hi to me and asked if I knew him and I said yes and and so he sat down and then another one of Chris's friends came in and um I followed him around with my eyes I'm like okay you're not Chris how do I know you so I was playing in my head you know okay that's another one of Chris's friends and they asked me if I knew who that was and I said yes. And so then I kind of looked from him back to the door. And I'm like, okay, where is he? Why isn't he coming yet? Where is he? Why doesn't he want to see me? I want him to come in and see me. Come in, Chris, come in and see me. Well, um, he never came in. So my mom asked me, Mandy, is there something that you need? Is there something you want to know? And I said, yes. And she's like, why don't you write it down? Well, you have to remember, 
Well, I didn't say I was paralyzed on my right side. I was paralyzed on my right side too. That's why they thought I was gonna be a vegetable. And um, I wasn't left-handed, I was right-handed. And I was, couldn't get that side to move. And so, mom hands me this paper and pen. And she's like, write down what you want. I forgot how to spell, I forgot how to make a letter. I got so mad, so mad that I just made circles. I just made circles and I was so mad and I pushed it away. I pushed it away from me and uh, mom grabbed the notepad. She grabbed the notepad and she took Linda and my dad out to the hallway and asked, does that say Chris? And everybody said yes. So somehow she got Chris out of all them circles. So dad comes back in. He's at the foot of my bed. Linda's on my right and mom's on my left and they grab my hand and I'm like, what is going on? Where is he? And uh, um, dad's like, Mandy, Chris is in a safe place. And I said, I said, oh, I didn't say I was thinking, okay, where is he? Where is he? We can't see me. He can't see me like this. I knew I was in an accident, but I thought it was just me. And I'm like, he, he can't come in. He can't see me. And dad said, do you remember us telling you about the accident that you were in? And I said, yeah. And he's like, well, Chris was killed. He's in heaven with Jesus. God revealed to me that he's in heaven. And I kind of, I kind of, you know, rolled that around in my head. And um, I, I, I kept, I, I couldn't shake my head, but I kept, I kept looking down, like not looking at anybody. And um, Dad's like, Mandy, your trike's out. You can't talk. You can ask us anything you want to ask us. And, or you can say anything you want to say. And I knew that my parents couldn't answer why, but that word came out along with no. So I screamed, no, why? No, why? And that was the only words I could get out because my throat was on fire. Dad's like, we, he said, Mandy, we don't know why. Only God knows why. But it's okay to be mad at God. It's okay to ask him why. It's okay to be mad for a short while. But do you remember that piece I told you about? My heart was at peace. So I was like, why would I be mad at God? In my head, like I couldn't get it out. But I'm like, no, I'm not mad at God. No, I don't know why he took Chris. I don't know for sure if Chris is in heaven. I believe my dad, but I wanted to know myself from the Lord that he was in heaven. So I kept asking, okay, Lord, you have to tell me whether or not Chris is with you. And I don't have time to tell you all the many miracles that happened with me in the hospital. So if you wanna know about any of those, feel free to come up and, or not come up, but ask me as, after the service. But, <clears throat> So I kept, I kept asking, I kept asking the Lord, um, you told me about him in March, right? March. And um, so I kept asking and I got no answer. Month after month after month of no answer. And you can go to the next picture. That was at Fairhaven. Do you see how small I was? 
I was two pounds away from my body shutting down completely. <clears throat> so I kept asking and I got no answer. And no answer month after month. But the week, I think it was the week before uh, our house caught fire. Um, I was sitting in my Rocky chair and I have this uh, Chris's memory book that I have pictures of Chris, his letters. Um, I have like, it's kind of like a tribute to him. And so I would write him letters. He'd write me letters. And so I would write to him even though he was gone. And um, I was like, Chris, I don't know where you are, but I want you to know that I love you and that you will always be a part of me. My pen stops. I can't get my pen to move. I'm like, I'm gonna get my answer. The Lord's gonna finally answer me. And I was thinking maybe he would answer me by having me write down where he was. Nope, I heard him. And I got, he's like, he is with me. And I got really excited. And you know how people ask where, what, when, the why questions, how? And he's, he gently said to me, do you remember the night before the accident? when you took Chris to your candlelight service and you at, or your pastor got up in front of the whole congregation and asked, if you die tonight, where would you go? That's when Chris made the choice for me. So pastor got up in front of the congregation, said the sinner's prayer to everybody, asked everybody if, if they wanted to do it, to do it in their seat he wasn't going to embarrass anybody just to make someone aware whether they come up and talk to him after service or they say it to a loved one just make it known that you accepted christ you don't have to embarrass yourself so the lord said that he made the decision for him that night but he wasn't going to tell you until Christmas. Well, the accident happened on December 23rd. The candlelight service was December 22nd. Folks, we are not guaranteed tomorrow. There is nowhere in the Bible that says you'll be guaranteed tomorrow. What is in the Bible is through Jesus, you have eternal life. Make the decision for Christ today. Pastor Bill. Josh, you don't mind interrupting your recording just for another minute? Oh, okay. So I think it's important for everybody who's able to uh, observe this testimony and be able to hear it. Uh, I, I think this is very important that, uh, Mandy, I, I like how you started off that you shared a prophecy that was shared uh, with you and uh, that you'd be able to reach thousands of lives for Christ and that many of you would be saved through your testimony. And the scripture that comes to my mind is that the gifts and promises of God are irrevocable. And a story that comes to my mind, and I'm, I'll be brief on this, <laughs> is the story of Abraham and his son Isaac. You remember Abraham and his son Isaac that uh, God told him to sacrifice his son on an altar. And when Abraham went to do that, we wondered how could a father put his son on an altar to sacrifice? Now there's a deeper biblical message to that. We're not talking about that right now. But um, in Hebrews, though, it's revealed to us that God knew, oh, that Abraham knew and trusted God so much that his promises would come to fulfillment, that he knew he could sacrifice his son and kill him. And he would still become this great nation through this very same son because his promises and his gifts are irrevocable.
They cannot be taken away. God is not a liar. And he will fulfill his promises through us. And when I also think about this, I feel like sharing this is something very important. When we first asked Mandy to share this testimony, since then, people that I've known have lost loved ones in car accidents. We have family that have been in car accidents recently. I've lost a coworker to a car accident within this past week. Mandy's right. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. But when you give your life to Jesus Christ, his gifts and his promises are irrevocable. I'd like to ask all of you today, and answer it in your heart. I don't care if you raise your hand or if you say something out loud or whatever. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you received him, accepted him, and acknowledge that he is the Lord of your life, your personal Savior? If not, we're going to say a prayer here in a moment. Or are you going to ask him into your heart, if you so desire to? If you feel a call, a God calling to you inside of your heart. Today is the day to receive him. You don't know what tomorrow might Well, You don't know it, what might happen when you walk outside of these doors today. We pray that each one of you has a long, prosperous, happy life. But we're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're not guaranteed the next moment. But God's gifts and his promises are irrevocable. And he who has began a good work in you will see it through to completion. So if you will, I'd like to take a brief moment of silence. I want you to examine your hearts. Please bow your heads with me. Nobody's looking, nobody's looking around to see what your reaction is. I'm not asking for people to raise their hands, but I want you to answer this question in your heart. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? If not, would you like to receive him into your heart this day and this moment if so I'd like to ask you to join me in a brief prayer I'll say the words but acknowledge them in your heart and join his kingdom today and as Mandy said tell somebody afterwards share your faith Share what the Lord has done for you. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. There's nothing good inside of me. But Lord God, you are good. And because of my failures, because of my lostness, you sent your son into the world to find me. He suffered the punishment that I deserved on a cross. He suffered for that moment so I would not have to suffer for an eternity. And Lord, this day, I receive your sacrifice. I receive the blood of Jesus Christ. I am redeemed through your Holy Spirit. Father God, take my life, transform it, mold it, help me to become everything you want me to be. Thank you, Lord, for choosing me and making me yours. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.